بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم على سيدنا وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا ونفعنا بما تعلمنا وزدنا من فضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة فهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so today we're going to do um, part three of Surat Al-Kahf and it's the last part and we're going to do the last story of the four stories and um, I'll pull it all together inshallah. So uh, this is like we said mentioned before that it's a very important story of our time uh, or surah rather of our time and we've been told to memorize the first 10 verses and the last 10 verses, which will be a protection in the grave and also um, the, a protection in, from the fitan of the Dajjal, inshallah. So um, moving on, uh, we want to do the, the fourth story, which is about Dhulkarnain. But before we do that, um, let's go over some of the themes that we've done so far so that uh, we can relate it to this story as well and how it joins with this story. So the first story that we learned about in this surah was about the cave. And we learned that if um, the cave is, is a concept, you know, it's a symbol that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using. And it's um, really about uh, entering into oneself. It's a symbolic journey. So entering into a cave is considered a symbolic journey and returning to the source, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this can be done physically, like we do it in Etika and Qiyam al-Layl, or it's done, um, this, this symbolic journey is done by um, going in, inside yourself in prayer. So this uh, is a very important theme, and the theme of it is also about um, birth and resurrection. So you'll see that this theme carries on throughout the whole of the surah, where uh, resurrection, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, bring us back to life after we die. This is something that a lot of people grapple with. Uh, a lot of faiths grapple with this. And in fact, it determines how you live in this life. So the people that don't live in, uh, who live in this life as though there's nothing after it, and you know there's nothingness in the grave and nothingness after that, then they obviously are going to live in this world in a very different manner. But people who believe that there's something to come afterwards, and um, you know they're going to transition into another life, they're going to live differently as well. So this idea of resurrection, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to resurrect us after we die, is a very uh, important theme in this surah. And we saw that in the um, kahf where the, the, the youth of uh, Futayah, they went to sleep for 309 years. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrected them again. Allah brought them like, uh, to life again. And it was important for them to see that um, they, were, they had been brought back to life. So the people of the time witnessed this. And so this um, parable has come down to us because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to know that um, there is resurrection and that we will be brought back to life. So this is a very important um, theme of this surah. Then the second uh, one that we did was, the second parable was of the two men, the two brothers inside the, uh, inside the garden. And one is a rich man and the other one is a poor one. And the rich man, he is full of his arrogance and pride. And he says, I think this will never end. And even if I go to the day of judgment, you know, things will be very different for me. So this, uh, this idea is, uh, was very important at the time the surah was revealed because uh, uh, the, the, the Makkan oligarchy, they used to believe, the small group of people who was ruling, they used to believe that they were more superior to other people because of their riches, because of their genealogy, because of their nobility, they thought they were better than others. So Allah corrects this notion in this, um, in this surah, because this is a common thing for human beings, that we, um, when Allah gives us a little bit of power on this earth, maybe he gives us money, uh, maybe children, maybe 
uh, power, whatever kind, whatever form it takes, then people start to think that they have intrinsic merit, that they are better than other people. So this intrinsic merit is, um, is, is from the shaitan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making us very aware of this in this surah, this idea that I am so good, you know, I'm so superior. I did this, I earned so much money, I made this business, you know, all of this stuff, this is from um, the school of uh, Iblis, right? This is the school of thought of Iblis. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really pointing this out to us about this intrinsic merit. And he does that by following this surah, by saying that you were created from clay. And he tells us the story of Adam alayhi salam, that you are made out of mud, that is your haqiqah, and you don't have intrinsic merit. The only person who will have intrinsic merit is who does good deeds and is sincere. So they have a sincerity in doing their good deeds and they reach Allah like this. So in the final analysis only, not even in this world, we will see who had intrinsic merit, that who really was good or not. But being human and, you know, with all our, our um, intricacies that we have, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, humans, people, we fall into this trap of thinking that we are better than other people. So humility is being taught in this surah as well. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu in this surah, um, following these verses, and before these verses, he said that go and sit with the poor people, go and sit with those people, not just the poor, but those people who remember Allah morning and evening. So they turn their faces to Allah. So when these kind of people who turn their faces to Allah, they because they're utilizing so much of their time and energy in uh, focusing on Allah, they might be poor in this world. They might be, uh, they might look very simple and poor in this world. But Allah is saying that go and sit with these people and you will be successful, not the other kind of people. So a lot is said about um, sohbah in this as well. And then um, the, the uh, one other theme that is uh, discussed in this is don't be deceived by the ornaments of this world. So, uh, you know, this theme is throughout the Quran that um, the ornaments of the world that we have put here. And these, there are many um, ornaments, you know, there's the ornaments uh, of beautiful homes, the land, the fruit, the vegetables, gold and silver, um, cattle, horses, clothing, farms, all of these are ornaments of this world. So don't be deceived by them. Don't think that you've made it just because Allah gives you some of this. Um, these are tests in the world. And if they don't lead you back to Allah, if any of these things don't lead you back to Allah, then they are, are a great detriment to you, right? This includes money, that if it doesn't lead you back to Allah, it doesn't lead you to your hereafter, um, good in your hereafter, then these are a very big test. And remember that the blessings of this world are tinged with poison, right? You have to remember that, that because um, the, the blessings of this world, like the ornaments of this world, you'll see that um, they can be good for you, but they can be a very big trial for you as well. So we are reminded of this in this um, surah. Then we're reminded of the purification of the heart, that uh, we have to keep purifying ourselves. This is why Allah told the Prophet Sallallahu and this was a, really a lesson for us, because Prophet, Prophet Sallallahu didn't need that but he he's doing he's been told that so that it'll be an example for us that we go and sit with people that will remind us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We go to the places that remind us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We spend the time that reminds us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we will have a purification of the heart. And um, another important point in the second story was accepting all of the believers, right? So make yourself patient and accept the believers. Um, all of them, whatever strata of society they are on, um, accept them and look after them like your family. So even the very poor people in the remotest parts of the world who you have nothing to do with, still consider them um, as your family, like your ummah, this is your ummah. So look at them like this and reach out and help these people. Right, um, you know, there's, you know, we uh, uh, just on a side note that uh, many times you'll see, like at the moment, there's a lot of charities and people um, uh, 
coming forward to ask for this and you know to sponsor this masjid and this project and etc cetera, etc cetera. so yesterday i saw a very unusual request and this is um uh, you know a, a woman in south africa she put this out about uh, and she had got it from somebody else on the facebook but she was supporting it and this is about supporting um the prisoners or the people who are already in prison in syria or people who have come out of prison now people like this uh, who don't have a voice and you know who how are they going to ask the rest of the world to help them you know the trials and the tribulations that they have been through uh, this is the muslim ummah the uh, you know the, maybe they're widows they orphans or uh, they've been through great great traumas inside these places you know you know the traumas of war like uh, some of them can't even talk about them, the things that they've seen and the things that they've experienced so this is the muslim ummah too so we have to become compassionate, uh, not just the, of the things that come uh, close to us and, uh, you know, that's advertised in our faces, but also in the remotest places where there might be people who are needing help. Um, so uh, that is acceptance of all of the believers. Right. Another theme is um, we talked about the ornamentation of the world, but uh, one ornament of the world, you know, we talked about the clothes and the jewelry and the houses and the cars, all of these are ornaments of the world. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put another ornament and which is bigger than all the ornaments. And that is that you are the ornament of this world. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you a human being and you are a great ornament of this world, subhanAllah. So this is uh, something um to think about that when human beings we can be the lowest of the law or we can be the highest of the high we can be so great that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can tell angels to bow down to us so reforming the self is a part of your dunya a part of this world so uh, making yourself reformed inside you know we always reforming outside with clothes and jewelry and whatever hairstyles and all of this we're always trying to reform outside making ourselves new outside but reforming the inside right cleaning yourself out and doing a full reformation inside so that you become a, a jewel right that, um that a, a, a real human jewel that is um uh, the kamal of living in this world that is actual success of living in this world so one of the ornaments of this world is yourself that if you can reform yourself and you can make yourself in a position you are in a way that you are one of you become one of the jewels to Allah then you have got real success and one of the main themes of this surah is um, understand the life that we live in today right we might think this surah happened 1400 years ago you know it's far away but no, this surah is very much a very modern surah because all the trials that it's talking about are related to us right now in this era that we're in. So it's very important to go back and reflect on these, uh, these stories that what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us in these stories and um, you know the main narratives which are the stories. It's a story, but within the story, there's a story. And within that story is our story. So we have to go back into these stories and find um, our story inside this story. And, um, you know, there's uh, a lot of uh, one other theme that is mentioned here is the uh, idea of the barzakh. That's the interspace. So before, uh, between death, after we die from this world and, and before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrects us, you know, brings us up on the day of judgment, there will be an interspace, which is called the barzakh, right? So this is a very important part as well. And that has been touched on in these stories. So there's like the sleepers of the cave, they have a barzakh, they go into that sleep, which can be considered a barzakh. Uh, Musa, uh, Musa meets a mysterious teacher, Khidr and uh, they, you know, he's, the sign is that they will meet Majma al-Bahrain, they're going to meet at the uh, interspace, right? So this idea of the barzakh interspace um, is also a very important idea for us, and Allah is drawing our attention um, to that. The in the in the story of uh, Musa 
and Khidr uh, al-Islam that we covered yesterday, there's a very big detailed discussion between um, the, the, you know, the, the student and the teacher. This is a very important relationship in Islam that um, the student teacher relationship, and it's done on two levels. One is the, the relationship between Musa alayhi salam and um, Yusha bin Nun, who's known as Joshua. So these two, uh, they are, the, the, it's a prophet and the disciple and they're traveling along. And then there's another, there's another uh, prototype that is given to us, which is the relationship between Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam. And this is a really interesting story because they both have very different knowledges. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is bringing them together to make Musa alayhi salam learn the knowledge of Khidr alayhi salam. Now, a lot of people get hung up on one type of knowledge in the world. So for example, scholars um, will get hung up on the Sharia knowledge that this is the most important knowledge. And if we just have this, then that is it. We can, you know, we don't need any other knowledge. But there are other kinds of knowledge too in the world. And um, there is also the spiritual knowledge, which uh, they has come down from the Sahabas and from our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is also, Khidr Alaihi Salam is a prototype of that kind of knowledge, the knowledge of the unseen. And even though spiritual knowledge is not necessarily the knowledge of the unseen, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing our attention to this, that, uh, you know, if you just have one type of knowledge, you can become stagnant inside it. You know, that knowledge can become um, stagnant. So you might need another kind of knowledge to offset the knowledge that you already have, to give it some light, right? Because uh, if you're just studying law, for example, Sharia is just law. So if you're studying law, for example, and that's what you're spending all your time on, and that's all you, that you're thinking about, then you can lose out on the spirituality of things, right? Or to understand the purposes behind these laws. So um, it's a very subtle point. This is a daqaiq in this um, uh, in this uh, story, but it's a very important point for us today that um, we have to keep on learning, number one, until we die. It's the beauty of Islam that we um, keep on learning. We don't stop learning. We don't, uh, you know, people think that you go to school and you go to college and that's it, you've done your learning. That's not true. Islamically, we are told to learn from the cradle to the grave. So our learning journey, uh, um, the learning is has to be done um, all the time and every day, every day we should be learning something new. You know, um, it's amazing because the more books that you open and one of the uh, blessings of this era has been that people have started opening books uh, again because we were, a lot of us, we were relying on digital media and um, getting by on stuff that we read, um, what is sent to us on the media. But the benefit of opening the books, alhamdulillah, is that there's so much of knowledge that has been preserved in the books. And you'll open one book, which will lead you to another book, to another book, subhanAllah. And so many of the um, uh, mashayikh who are talking uh, in these days are also pointing us to lots of different uh, sources where we can get, uh, you know, the, these are really very valuable uh, um, drinking sources of knowledge where we can get, you know, people who have uh, died and left us a book and, you know, so much of precious knowledge has been retained in that book. So that's another thing that we, uh, we are being pointed out to um, in this story about the, the knowledge. And, um, you know, we know that uh, in the last year, so many of our great shuyukh have died. Uh, just this last week, two very great um, alims, uh, uh, and Mufakih of the Deen, you know, people who understood the Deen very well, they have passed away. So people are, are, like this are going. So it's more, it's very important for us to um, get back to the original sources of this Deen and to learn from there. Uh, you know, we waste a lot of time listening to uh, like a lot of stuff that comes, uh, like amusement or uh, trivia that comes onto our uh, social feeds. But we should focus on quality material so that we can learn the right things. Right, so Bismillah rahman rahim we're going to, with that, we're going to go into our uh, fourth and last story today. And this is a story of Dhul Qarnayn. And you might have heard this story before, um, 
you, but let's do the story first and then we'll talk about um, the issues with this story. Bismillah ar rahman ar rahim um, the, It's verse 83 and it says, they ask you about Dhulqa name. Bismillah ar rahman ar rahim Wa yas'alunaka an dhulqa name. Qul sa'atlu alaykum minhu dhikra. So it says, when the uh, the people came back to the Prophet Sallallahu and they asked him about uh, Dhulqar name. They said, tell us, you remember the three, qu three questions that they had. One was about uh, who are those youth that dis disappeared in ancient times? So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi answered them that those were Ashab al-Kahar. Then they asked about the Ruh and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said that, you know, the Ruh is with Allah and he knows more about it. And this is the third question that they asked. Uh, who was the uh, mighty king who traveled from the east to the west and he met uh, mysterious people. So then um, the, the verse is starting by saying, they ask you about Dhulqar name. So tell them, uh, Allah is saying, tell them, I shall shortly make mention of him to you. So uh, we verily granted him kingship on earth and give him every type of asset. So we know from this that Dhulqar name was a king and he was he had been given many 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 assets that means he was a very powerful king he had been given lots of things which gave him um, power he had been given might he had been given strength and army uh, prestige honor uh, obedience from his people um, the ability to travel and lots of other things so um, these are assets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him so he journeyed on a road verse 85 it says so he journeyed on a road until he reached a place where the sun sets and he found it setting in a black spring where he found a nation. So he travels to the, uh, he travels all the way uh, to where the sun sets, right? So he sets out on a journey and he goes all the way to where the um, sun sets. And he finds, he found it setting in a black spring where he found a nation. So he found the sun setting and he said that, uh, it was a setting in a black spring. That means in a body of water. Now, you know that the sun doesn't set in a body of water. But if you're looking from the horizon, it can it can look like that. If there's water, it can look like that. So he found a nation. So he, we told him, so Allah says, we told him, O Dhulqar Nain, either you punish them or you adopt a kind attitude towards them. So Allah says, we give you this choice. Um, because they were, they were uh, idolaters, they were worshipping idols. So um, Allah said to Dhulqar Nain, either you can punish them or you can adopt a kind attitude towards them. He said, as for him who oppresses, we shall soon punish him and then shall return him to his Lord, who will punish him more severely. So um, Dhulqar Nain says that those people who oppress, those people, we will um, punish them. So if you are oppressing yourselves by not worshipping Allah, if you're oppressing other people, we will punish him and then he will return to his Lord who will punish him more. As for him who believes and does good deeds, his shall be a most beautiful reward. So um, then Dhulqar Nain says, but who believes in God and who does good deeds, then he will have a good reward. And we shall speak mildly of him with regard to our affairs. Right? And then, so that's what happened in one place. Then he journeyed to the east. He, uh, he journeyed on a road until he reached a place where the sun rose. And we found it rising upon a nation to whom he had not given any veil against it. So he found the, the, a people there, a group of people. And these were strange people because um, they, ha they didn't have, uh, the sun was rising, but they had no protection of um, the sun from, like, they didn't have houses they didn't have any shelter. They just lived like that. So um, it says that he found it rising upon a nation to whom he did not, uh, we had not given any veil against it. Now, this talks about his travels uh, for, to the east and to the west. So if you imagine in that time to be able to travel in a time, and we're talking about um, times when they didn't have fast travel, when they didn't have um, airplanes and uh, you know, they were just traveling by foot and maybe with animals, horses. But he traveled all the way from one side of the earth to the other side, subhanAllah. So that was a miracle in itself. But Allah had given him the power and the ability to do that. And then on his travels, he, he's meeting these groups of people. So that's what we're being told in this, uh, in, um, in this surah. 
And this is how it was. So Allah is saying this is how it was. For those people who didn't have a shelter from, from the sun, this is how it was. And we surely had knowledge of everything that he possessed. So uh, Allah is saying that we had the knowledge of everything that he um, possessed. You know, Allah had given him mental acumen. He had given him physical acumen and with resources and people. You know, he had all of these things at his disposal, disposal and he was making this trip. He then journeyed on a road until he reached between two mountains. He found thereby a nation who could barely understand anything. So then he came to, uh, he journeyed to uh, between two mountains and he found a nation, he found a group of people and they could barely understand anything. They could barely talk. I mean, they, do, they weren't a civilized people. They barely had a language and they couldn't, they were, they couldn't even understand anything. And they submitted, they said, oh, look her name. The Yajuj and Majuj spread anarchy on earth. So is it possible that we collect some money for you so that you may erect a barrier between us and them? So these these people, they had um, a group of another group who were called the Yajuj and Majuj. These are two tribes. So they had this tribe who used to come and trouble them a lot. They would come and they would eat their food and drink their water and break their houses. You know, they used to trouble them a lot. So they said that they said when they saw this mighty king, they came to him and they said, can we uh, collect some money uh, or give you something so that you make a wall between us and them? Because they live on the other side of the valley. So if we had a, uh, if we had a wall between us, then they couldn't come on to our side and they wouldn't trouble us so much because they're very, very troublesome. So Dhukar name he replied, he said, alayhi salam, the power and authority that my Lord has vested in me is better. That means what I have is better. You don't have to give me money. So assist me with strength. Uh, all you have to do is help me with your manpower and I shall erect a fortified wall between you and them. So he says that I will make a wall between you and them. Bring me some pieces of iron. When these were leveled between the cliffs, he commanded, blow. When it was made into fire, he said, bring me molten copper to pour over it. They were not able to scale it. So um, what he says, what Dhulkar Nain salam, says is that you help me with your manpower and I want you to bring me huge pieces of iron. So when they bought these iron, and remember, uh, think about how powerful these people were, that they were carrying all these sheets of iron. And they, when they bought it, they leveled it between the cliffs so they made an iron wall and it, uh, then he said blow. So they had some kind of an instrument which they could make the iron hot so that it could come together, right? So when they heated up the iron, then it, um, it became more firm. And then he said, now bring me molten copper. That means uh, we're going to get hot copper and we're gonna pour it over so that this wall becomes very, very solid. Now you think about a wall that's made out of iron and made out of copper, right? And so they made this wall. And then verse 97, it says they were not able to scale it. That means the Yajuj Majuj, they were trapped on the other side. Neither were they able to make a hole in it. He said, uh, Durkan Nain says, this is a mercy from my Lord. When the promise of my Lord will come, he will shatter it to pieces. The promise of my Lord is ever true. And we can see the nobility of this king that um, he was a believer and he believed in Allah and he was a very noble king. And at the end he says, this is a mercy from my Lord. What does he say? That everything that has happened that we made, we were able to make this, um, we were able to make this uh, wall, that uh, it, it is a mercy from Allah. And he says that um, the, the promise of my Lord will come and he will shatter it to pieces. That means a time will come when this wall will be shattered to pieces, but until that until that time, they won't be able to come out. And then he says, the promise of my uh, Lord is ever true. On that day, we will leave the criminals who surge against each other. The trumpet will be blown and we will gather them all. <clears throat> so this is uh, in the verse, it's telling us verse 99, that, <clears throat> that this uh, the time that this wall breaks will be before the day of judgment right before the trumpet is blown. So this is a sign of the day of judgment that the this wall will come down and the Yajuj Majuj will come out. Uh, and this is in the Quran. On that day, we will present hell before the disbelievers, those whose eyes were veiled 
from my remembrance and they were unable to hear. So this is a story of Yajuj and Majuj uh, and this is the story first of uh, Dulkan name. Now there's many questions people have always um, speculated about this uh, Dulkar name and the coming of Yajuj Majuj and the wall that Dulkar name erected. Now um, uh, people have debated these questions and it, we're living in an age where we're accustomed to research and investigation. So people have tried to look for this wall as well and you'll see um, lots of people who um, say that this is the wall of um, you know, this is the wall. They, they've located some spaces on earth where they say that these are the walls. However, um, as a believer, we should know, we should not be affected by these questions. We shouldn't be speculating and worrying where this wall is and where the Yajush Majus are coming, going to come, uh, going to come out of. And we should be satisfied with the, the questions that um, the, the thing, the, you know, the answers that uh, the Quran gives us. So, who was Dhulkar Nain? Now, about Dhulkar Nain, people have speculated too. And one of the things that people say that he was um, Alexander the Great, the Alexandra who, who made Alexandria in Egypt, right? That Alexander the Great. And he's known as Alexandria of Macedonia. And his advisor was the philosopher Aristotle. So he's very famous. Now, um, most of the research uh, refutes this notion because uh, it's said that Dulkar Nain lived almost 2,000 years before Alexander the Great, right? And so it can't be this one. Moreover, Alexander uh, of Macedonia, he was a tyrant. He, um, you know, he killed a lot of people and um, he disgraced a lot of people. So uh, he can, cannot be a Dulkar Nain because Dulkar Nain was a very noble and good king. And you can just see from the story that um, he traveled uh, uh, from east to west. Allah had given him so much power and yet he was going around helping people. So even on his travels, he was helping people. So he, this shows his nobility that he was a, um, a king that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had truly blessed. And um, so, uh, some people say that he was serious, but even that, um, it cannot be true just because of the evidence that surrounds it, right? And um, we say that he is a mu'min, he was a believer, Dhulkarnain was a believer, he was a just ruler, and whose advisor was um, Khidr salam. And he was also a prophet, so we also say that he, uh, he could have been a prophet, right? So the second was... Um, and his name has also been mentioned that his Hafiz ibn Hajar presents some opinions that his name could have been Abdullah ibn Dhahak uh, or it could have been Mus'ab ibn Abdullah ibn Qattan or it could have been Harmas or Hardis. So it could have been any one of these names. So we don't really know um, exactly um, when we try to match it with modern history. But uh, we know that he was from the progeny of Sam the son of uh, Nuh alayhi salam. And um, this is important because remember we mentioned that three of Nuh alayhi salam's um, sons, they survived. So many of the different progenies come from uh, these three sons. So he was from the progeny of Sam. Right, and, the, and there's a lot more discussion um, about Dhulkar Nade uh, in the Tafsir. But one of the things that, uh, why was he called Dulkar Nain? So Dulkar Nain denotes two horns or two centuries. And um, this is, uh, some people say that it's because of the, his, his, uh, his crown had two horns. And this might be, um, I, I read this a long time ago, um, but uh, I didn't come across it right now, but uh, it might be that it, this history, because he traveled all the way um, to the west and, um, and to the east, uh, this history might be uh, related to the um, Nordic or Norwegian people as well. So um, it's amazing uh, how, you know, like these little clues that we have. And if you look at their, uh, their symbols, they have these um, 
headwear that they wear with the two horns. So th there might be some relation with that as well, but you'd have to look into that, right? So uh, he's known as Dulkarnain, which means the one with the two horns. That's what the word Dulkarnain means. He, he was a king that was known as that. Now it says that um, he traveled to the West and um, Allah gave him every kind of asset and he was able to do that. So he came to the West where um, uh, he, and on, on route he uh, conquered many territories. So even getting there um, to this place, uh, he, he conquered all of the territories and then he came to a place where the sun sets and um, it says that it, it's set in a black spring. So it refers, it can refer to an ocean and um, it can refer to the sun setting on a coastline because that's how it appears to us when we're looking at it. Right, and then he journeys to the east and uh, not, not a lot of detail is given, but we know that he, as, as he's journeying along, he's conquering the lands as well. And um, so he comes to a people when he comes to the east where uh, they have, they're living in a place where they, they don't have any veil against the sun. So they don't, li they don't live in homes or tents, but they live in the open. Um, and it's possible that the place was cold and they required the sunlight to keep themselves warm. So um, maybe he helped them to, showed them how to make um, shelter maybe he helped these people as well and then the third journey he comes to so there's three journeys mentioned and the third journey he comes to he reaches between um, two mountains and he found um, nearby a mountain uh, a nation who could barely understand anything and they were terrified of the Yajuj and the Majuj so uh, they request Vulkar name to build a, uh, a barricade a wall between them and they offer to uh, pay uh, um, Dulkarnain, the king Dulkarnain, but he says that I have something better. That means I will use my uh, strength and I will use uh, um, uh, my ideas. I have a creative idea in which I can help you. And you just have to help me with your manpower and support. And I shall erect a, 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 um, a wall between you and them. So he first the, thing, the first thing he asks for, he says, bring me some pieces of iron and um, so the iron was used as bricks and then the uh, wood and coal was used as mortar right so uh, the, the these are huge bricks and then they in between to hold them together they used um, wood and coal and so when they were leveled between the cliffs so these were can you imagine making a wall between two cliffs and that's what they did they made a huge wall between the two cliffs and the valley was barricaded and then Allah command and then he commanded um, that the uh, they uh, blow so the author of Jalalin says that some instruments were used to stimulate combustion so to stimulate some heat some kind of heat so that the wall would come together it would stick together and eventually when the the iron was made into uh, into fire um, that, that means the iron melted and the pieces came together and it fall, formed a solid wall. So this was sufficient in itself, but Dulkar Nain, he, um, he fortified it even further. That means the iron wall, wall would have sufficed, but he said that let's put some more, or let's put some uh, melted copper over it so that it becomes even more strong. And because of the height and the strength and the smoothness of the wall, the uh, Yajuj and the Majuj were not able to scale it. So it's a very tall wall. Um, some people say, have said that uh, it could be the Great Wall of China. So it couldn't be that wall because this wall has to be made out of, um, first of all, iron, and then it has to be made out of, with copper poured over it. So it has to be made like this. Now, um, the, and we're mentioning this because in the Tafsir you'll find there's many people who have cited that they've seen the wall and they've seen this evidence and that evidence. But um, we don't really know where the wall is. Um, 
And then after completing the wall, Dhulkarnain said to the people, this is a mercy from my Lord. It was mercy from Allah that he has accord, he was accorded the honor of completing this great feat. And it was because of his mercy that these people were now safe from the harassment of the Yajuj and Majuj. Now we learn a very big thing over here that when we do something good, we always attribute it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, we should never attribute it to ourselves. Now, um, a lot of people, when they uh, do the evaluation of whatever they did, you know, they'll praise themselves and they said, oh, we did it like this and we were able to do this and do that. But our, the first thing that we have to do is we have to attribute everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we don't have the ability, we really do not have the ability to do anything. So, um, Dhulkar Nain, um, you can see that he is a noble and you can see that he is a man of God because this is what he does after completing it. He gives a complete honor to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it was because of Allah's mercy we did this. And then um, he continues to tell the people that when the promise of my Lord will come true, um, he will shatter it to pieces and the promise of my Lord uh, is ever true. So um, some commentators have mentioned that the promise refers to the day of judgment. So that before the day of judgment, um, the Yajuj and Majuj who are behind this wall, they will break this wall and they will come out. And the emergence of the Yajuj and Majuj is a sign of, ju of judgment, right? Uh, because in Surah Al-Anbiya, it says, until the time arrives when the Yajuj and Majuj will be released, and they will scurry down every hill. So this is a verse from the Quran, verse 96 of Surah 21, which tells us that the Yajuj, and the time will not come until the Yajuj and Majuj, the Gog and Magog are released and they will scurry down every hill. This tells us their quantity, that they will be in the millions and trillions. They will be far more than the people that are living in this world. And then we're going to, um, we do a hadith which will show you why there will be that many that they'll be like really they'll just um, like ants they will just come and take over the earth and it says they will scurry down every hill so once they get out from behind that um, mountain they're just going to flood the earth all you'll see is yajuj and majuj everywhere and then um, it says on that day we will leave the criminals to surge against each other so the Yajuj and Majuj will break from captivity and spread on earth in great haste. And according to Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, um, this verse refers to the emergence of all creation from their graves on the Day of Judgment. Right? This is one interpretation of it. Um, the trumpet will be blown and we will gather them all. On that day we will present hell before the disbelievers. Um, so then Allah describes the disbelievers by saying that they are those whose eyes were veiled from my rem remembrance and they were unable to hear. So um, this is a part of the verse where Allah SWT is telling them now that this is a sign of the day of judgment, then day of judgment will come, Allah will resurrect everybody and then Qiyamah will come, right? And this was all, these are verses because the, um, the Jews and the Mushrikeen in Makkah, they did not uh, believe in the Prophet SAW and they stubbornly refused to believe um, in, in in what the Prophet ﷺ was saying. So these verses were revealed. Now, um, the emergence of Yajuj and Majuj um, is mentioned in the Quran. And um, Muslim reports that uh, Prophet ﷺ said, the judgment day will not appear before these 10 signs. So what we're going to do next, uh, these are called the major signs. Right? There's minor signs of the Day of Judgment and major signs. So in this hadith in Muslim, um, these uh, 10 signs are mentioned. That these 10 signs have to happen before the Day of Judgment will come. So number one, people are swallowed by the earth in the east. So these are earthquakes and the earth opens up and it swallows them. Uh, so people are swallowed um, by earth in, in the east and people are swallowed in the west. Number two, and number three, this incident occurs in the Arabian Peninsula as well. So these are three locations where earthquakes will take place. And these have already happened, by the way. Um, earthquakes in the east, earthquakes in the west, and earthquakes in the Arabian Peninsula. Number four, smoke appears, right? This is smoke, and this has also happened as well. You can do your research. 
and then number five is the gel makes his appearance. Okay, so number five is the gel makes his appearance. Number six, the, the creature of the earth appears. This is a type of animal that will emerge from the ground. And this is called Dabatul Ard. So a creature will come out of the earth and it will talk to the people. Right? Mention was made of this in Surah al -Namal. So This is mentioned in the Quran. So this will come, the creature of the earth will come. Number seven, the emergence of Yajuj and Majuj. This is what we're talking about in this um, surah. In this um, surah, and this is why this the first ten um, verses, last ten uh, verses, are also a protection from the Dajjal. <clears throat> um, remember that <clears throat> the, the Dajjal will not <clears throat> not just come. Um, you know, it won't just appear as a man one day. But there will be a Dajjali era. You know, a lot of things will happen. Um, the stage will be set for him. Number eight, the rising of the sun from the west. And number nine, um, so the sun will rise from the opposite side. Number nine, uh, the, the fire will rage from Aden and drive people towards the plains of reckoning. So a great fire will come. And then number 10, the descent of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam from the heavens. So these are the, um, the, the Isa alayhi salam will come from the heavens. That's, that's also a sign before the day of judgment. And a Muslim sheds more light on the emergence of Yajuj and Majuj. It is recorded from the Holy Prophet sallam, that after the Jal is killed by Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam and he lives among the people, Allah will send the following revelation to him. O Isa, I shall release such servants of mine who against whom none can fight. Therefore, take my believers to Mount Dur for safety. So it's said that Isa Islam will be in the world and then Allah will reveal um, a wahi to him that, uh, you know, a, a group of people are going to come, servants of mine. And so we learn from this that um, they, uh, they are going to be human. Yajuj and Majuj are going to be human. Many people imagine them like a different breed, like there's something else. But we learn from the hadiths that they will actually be human. And so, and we even told the genealogy of them is coming up. And so it says that um, uh, Isa al-Islam will be told that go to Mount Dur. So go and for the safety, go into the mountains. Because when they come on the earth, they will cause anarchy and you won't have the strength to fight with them. So um, they will be told to go there. Consequently, Allah will release them and they will scurry down every hill. Their numbers will be so large that when the first part of their army will pass by the lake of Tabiriya, that means the Sea of Galilee, they will finish all the water. That means they'll drink all the water from the uh, Sea of Galilee. That's how many there will be. And when the latter part of the army will pass by, they will say, it seems that there was once water here. So one part of the, the first part will come and they will drink all the water and the, it will dry up. Imagine that the, when the last part of the, um, the army comes, they will say that it looks like there was water once here. So imagine how many there will be, right? And um, it's, it's been uh, said, Alama Azhari mentions, Rahmanullah, that the lake measures 10 miles in length and six miles in breadth during his time. So during his time, that's how big this lake was. So when they will reach the, uh, the Khamar mountain in Baitul Maqdis, they will say, we have killed all on earth. So when they come to Baitul Maqdis just outside, they will say, we've killed everything on earth. So they will cause anarchy. That means they will kill people, they will loot, they will plunder, they will break down houses. They will just basically cause mayhem on earth, the Yajuj and the Majuj. So they will come to Baitul Maqdis and they will say, that we have killed everything on earth. Let us now kill those in the heavens. And this tells you the state of their mind. Look at how they're thinking. They will then fire their arrows to the skies and Allah will cause these to return with blood on them. So Allah will humor them, you know, because they'll put their, they, they said, okay, we've conquered the earth. Now let's go conquer the heavens. So Allah will humor them by bringing, sending these arrows down with, um, with blood on it. And it said that at that time, the people, the believers with Sayyidina Isa a.s. would be so hard pressed for food in the Tur mountain that the head of a bull will be more valuable to them than a hundred gold coins. That means there will be starvation in the mountains, there won't be any food. 
the, and so if somebody was to offer them um, the head of a bull, right, uh, it would be more valuable than a hundred gold, gold coins. Um, then Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, so it'll be a very difficult time. This indicates to us, it'll be a very difficult time in the mountains. Then Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam will pray to Allah and the believers will play, pray to Allah to destroy the Yajuj Majuj. And Allah will inflict them with a disease that normally kills goats and camels when it erupts from the nose. SubhanAllah. Isn't that interesting? That it's a disease that normally kills animals, goats and camels, and it is erupts from the nose. So it will erupt from their necks and kill them all as if they were one person. That's a very interesting um, that, uh, statement. Um, and we can relate that to what's happening right now. Their corpses will be scattered about as if a wild animal ravaged them. So um, this, this disease will kill all of them. And now we can understand how a disease can kill. So their corpses will be scattered all over the earth like wild animals. And then Isa uh, salam and the believers will descend from the mountain. Um, they will not find a single place that is free from their bodies and stench of Yajuj Majuj. That means the whole earth will be covered with them. They will then again supplicate to Allah, whereupon Allah will send large birds with necks like camels. These birds will cast all the corpses away to where Allah wills. Thereafter, Allah will send a light rain that will fall on every part of the earth, washing it as clean as if it is a mirror. So after this, Allah will cleanse the earth again. So after the Yajuj Majus have died and the, the earth is cleaned up uh, from all of the um, their uh, debris, then Allah will make the earth clean again like a mirror. SubhanAllah. Then Allah will command the earth to bring forth its vegetation and provisions. It will then spill forth everything and produce all its fruits. As a result of this, this blessings, a group of people will be able to eat from a single pomegranate and they will be able to make umbrellas from the skin of a pomegranate. Now this is in the hadith, you, uh, you, might, you may have read uh, but Isa alayhi salam comes, there will be great um, affluence on the earth, right? And there will be great peace on the earth. It will be, so this will happen after the Yajuj Majuj have uh, been killed. And it's said that at that time, a pomegranate will be so big that an entire group, big family, can eat from one pomegranate. And the, the, the skin of the pomegranate, you'll be able to make umbrellas out of them. That's how big the pomegranate will be. That's how many blessings there'll be on earth. And he said at that time, there'll, there'll be so much blessings in milk that a large gathering of people will be able to fill themselves with the milk of one camel. In a like manner, a large tribe will be able to satisfy with the milk of a cow. A huge tribe will be able to just uh, have the milk from one cow. And a smaller tribe will require the milk of only a goat to fill themselves. So subhanAllah, there'll be so much barakah on the earth at this time. Um, and Judgment Day will be, then be very close and the believers will enjoy extremely comfortable lives. Now, since Judgment Day can only dawn upon the disbelievers, Allah will send, uh, Allah will send a pleasant breeze that will reach the sides of the believers, right? And causing them all to pass away. So a, a breeze will come and all the believers, they will all die from this. Thereafter, only the worst people will live on earth who will commit adultery in public like donkeys. And Judgment Day Qiyamah will draw upon these people. So the worst people will live on the earth and then um, the Day of Judgment will draw upon these people. So this is um, a, a synopsis of the um, Yajuj and the Majuj and how they will be uh, released on the, um, on the earth. And this is what we've been told in the Quran and the Hadith. And this is what we should be believing because a lot of people um, now, they're looking at, um, uh, you know, history books, secular history books, and they're trying to go with the deductions that um, scientists and other people are making. So, but this is what we're being told um, in, the, uh, in the Hadith and the Quran. And now we know the signs of the Judgment Day, they're classified into two. And these are... Um, first are those that appear a long time before and second are those that appear close to the Day of Judgment. 
And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that Judgment Day, Qiyama, and himself are like the index finger and the middle finger. That means they're that close. Is the hadith from Mishkat. And um, in, Ibn Majah reports that Isa a.s. told the Prophet on the night of ascension, Mi'raj, that the corpses of the Yajuj Majuj will be cast into the sea and that judgment day shall occur so close thereafter that a pregnant woman who is near to delivery and her family have no idea when she might surprise them with her delivery. So Qiyamah will be like that pregnant woman who is ready to deliver and they, her family don't know when she will deliver. So Yajuj Majuj will come that close to the Day of Judgment. Right. And how many are there, um, how many will be the um, Yajuj Majuj? We can see that from this hadith. It says the Prophet Sallallahu on the Day of Judgment, um, Allah will instruct Adam Alayhi to separate those people who are destined for help when he will ask how many are they how many are they to be allah will say that the people of hell will number 999 from every thousand right so uh, adam alayhi salam will ask how many people are going to hell and how many people will go to heaven so um, uh, allah will tell adam alayhi salam that one person will go to jannah and 999 will of the thousand will go to jahannam to the hellfire so the Holy Prophet ﷺ said, at that moment, you know, when people will hear this, every youth will turn white. Every nursing mother will forget her suckling infant. This is in the Quran. right? And this is a moment when this will happen. Every nursing mother will forget her suckling infant. And every pre pregnant woman will abort. And you will see people in a drunken stupor, whereas they were not, had not been drunk. But Allah's punishment is severe. So this is, the, this is um, indicating to the terror of the the sheer terror of the Day of Judgment. And when um, the Sahaba heard this from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu they asked who will enter heaven? I mean, who will be that one in a thousand who will enter heaven? If only one of every thousand will enter. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied, accept the glad tidings that the one who will, who will be entering uh, will be from yourselves and a thousand will be from Yajuj Majuj. Right, so the uh, the 999, they will be the Yajuj Majuj who will enter the hellfire. And this hadith informs us that they are, Yajuj Majuj are from the progeny of Adam. So they will be human. So there's a huge tribe behind a wall who, who, are, who are human, who are waiting to be released into the world. Hafiz ibn Hajar writes that the hadith illustrates the number of the Yajuj and Majuj as being a thousand to one. Uh, compared to the Ummah of the Prophet So that's the number that they will be in the trillions. It is therefore evident that no nation has emerged thus, thus far in such numbers. It means we've never had a tribe that has had that many in numbers, right? Right, then there's a lot of discussion of where this wall is and what, you know, we... Um, uh, much of it is speculation and uh, people are looking now because uh, the signs of the day of judgment are very uh, close but we're going to finish um, this whole surah and it finishes with a beautiful verse um, it says the last two verses it says if the ocean was ink for the words of my lord so it says قُلْ لَوْ كَانَ الْبَحْرُ مِدَادًا لِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّي so if the ocean was ink, like if you turn all the oceans into ink for the words of my Lord, the ocean would be depleted before the words of my Lord can end. That means if you were to turn the oceans into um, ink to write the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And you turn all the uh, trees in the world into uh, qalam, into pens, and you use the ink of the oceans to write the uh, praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this verse is telling us that it, um, the, the ocean would be depleted before the words of my Lord can end. That means that there are kalimat uh, rabbi the words of Allah are so many. And even if we supplemented it with a like amount of ink, that means even if we bought the oceans again, we bought the same amount of water again and made that into ink, still it would not be sufficient to write the words of Allah. And then he says, 
قل إنما أنا بشر مثلكم. He says the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, I am a human being like yourselves. Revelation comes to me that your deity is but one deity, right? It says, أنا بشر مثلكم يوحى إلي أنما إلهكم إله واحد. That revelation comes to me that there is only one deity. So whoever uh, aspires to meeting their Lord, the last verse, look at this. فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُو لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ Whoever aspires for the meeting with his Lord should فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا So that person should do good deeds. وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادِهِ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا And that person should not associate anyone as partner in the worship of his Lord. So this last verse is telling us that if you aspire to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then um, you should do good deeds and not associate anyone as partner in the worship of, of um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, as you will appreciate, this is an amazing surah of the Quran. Every surah is amazing, mashallah. And this is a, a really a, su a surah of our times because four trials have been mentioned in these four sto stories. And just as a summary, we're going to close with this. It says, the first story is the people of the cave and there's a trial of faith. And all these trials are with us right now in this moment. Uh, this is a trial of faith, right? Uh, uh, you know, a fight between good and evil. So this, that's the first story. The second story is about the garden and the people in the garden. And that's a trial of wealth. And that is with us today as well, the fitna of the wealth. The third story is about Musa and Khidr, and that's a trial of knowledge. And we have that now too. And the fourth story is about Dhul Qalnain, and it's a trial of power. What do you do with the power? So the question, if you really simplified it, and we put this question of what this surah is about, Allah is asking us, what are you doing with your faith? What are you doing with your wealth? What are you doing with your knowledge? What are you doing with your power? So that is a summary of this whole surah that we read on Fridays, uh, Surah al -Kahf. It's a beautiful surah Allah SWT has given to us. Um, memorize the first uh, first and the last surah, um, 10 verses. I get your children to memorize them as well, very important verses of the Quran. Even if you don't memorize the entire Quran, there's certain points of the Quran that you should memorize. And these um, first and less, last 10 so, um, verses are very important of Surah Al-Kahf. And um, really this surah should be studied again and again. Like we should be taking this, opening our Qurans and studying this Surah Al-Kahf every week. We should uh, study it in our masajid, in our homes, and really looking at the lessons of uh, this uh, surah because Allah is calling us to know the reality of um, life in this surah. And as, as you mentioned, all the other themes that we mentioned at the beginning of this session as well. So Alhamdulillah, we're going to conclude over here. Now, we're going to take a break tomorrow and um, we're coming back on Thursday for our last session, inshallah. So uh, Thursday will be our last session for this Ramadan's Treasures of the Quran series. So uh, hopefully uh, in the next session, we'll just tie everything um, together, bring it all together, what we've learned, and then moving on what we should do with the Quran, inshallah. So and tonight is a big night, uh, another big night Allah has given us, another one, a tw uh, 27th night. So um, don't lose out, make lots of du'as, and remember me in your du'as as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, accept our ibadah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our fasting, our salah, our staying awake, our zakah, our sadaqah, reading Quran, our meeting with each other, um, our loving each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of this from us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us um, the, the right guidance to be on the right path. Um, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the right faculties that we need to understand the, his deen and understand his message, understand his Quran, and then to practice it sincerely so that he is pleased with us. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.